This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa, Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Five, Modern Times, Chatillon. Book Five, Chapter Six, The Emerald's Fall. That night marked the culmination of the Dracophile movement. The Royalists had no longer any doubt of its triumph. Their chiefs sent congratulations to Prince Crucho by wireless telegraphy. Their ladies embroidered scarves and slippers for him. Monsieur de Plume had found the green horse. The pious Agaric shared the common hope, but he still worked to win the partisans for the pretender. They ought, he said, to lay their foundations upon the bedrock. With this design he had an interview with three trade union workmen. In these times the artisans no longer lived, as in the days of the Draconides, under the government of corporations. They were free, but they had no assured pay. After having remained isolated from each other for a long time, without help and without support, they had formed themselves into unions. The coffers of the unions were empty, as it was not the habit of the unionists to pay their subscriptions. There were unions numbering thirty thousand members, others with a thousand, five hundred, two hundred, and so forth. Several numbered two or three members only, or even a few less. But as the lists of adherents were not published, it was not easy to distinguish the great unions from the small ones. After some dark and indirect steps, the pious Agaric was put into communication, in a room in the Moulin de Galette, with comrades Dagobert, Tronc, and Balafille, the secretaries of three unions, of which the first numbered fourteen members, the second twenty-four, and the third only one. Agaric showed extreme cleverness at this interview. Gentlemen, said he, you and I have not, in most respects, the same political and social views, but there are points in which we may come to an understanding. We have a common enemy. The government exploits you and despises us. Help us to overthrow it. We will supply you with the means so far as we are able, and you can, in addition, count on our gratitude. Fork out the tin, said Dagobert. The reverend father placed on the table a bag which the distiller of Connells had given him with tears in his eyes. Done, Done said the three companions. Thus was the solemn compact sealed. As soon as the monk had departed, Carrying with him the joy of having won over the masses to his cause, Dagobert, Tronc, and Balafille whistled to their wives, Amelia, Queenie, and Matilda, who were waiting in the street for the signal, and all six, holding each other's hands, danced around the bag, singing, And they ordered a salad bowl full of warm wine. In the evening all six went through the street from stall to stall singing their new song. The song became popular, for the detectives reported that every day showed an increase of the number of workpeople who sang through the slums, The Dracophile agitation made no progress in the provinces. The pious Agaric sought to find the cause of this, but was unable to discover it until old Cornmuse revealed it to him. "'I have proofs,' sighed the monk of Connells, "'that the Duke of Ampule, the treasurer of the Dracophils, has bought property in Porporzia with the funds that he received for the propaganda.' The party wanted money. Prince de Boseno had lost his portfolio in a brawl and he was reduced to painful expedients which were repugnant to his impetuous character. The Viscountess Olive was expensive. Cornmuse advised that the monthly allowance of that lady should be diminished. She is very useful to us, objected the pious Agaric. Undoubtedly, answered Cornmuse, but she does us an injury by ruining us. A schism divided the Dracophiles. Misunderstandings reigned in their councils. Some wished that, in accordance with the policy of M. Bigor and the pious Agaric, they should carry on the design of reforming the public. Others, wearied by their long constraint, had resolved to proclaim the dragon's crest and swore to conquer beneath that sign. The latter encouraged the advantage of a clear situation and the impossibility of making a pretense much longer, and in truth, 
the public began to see whither the agitation was tending, and that the Emerald's partisans wanted to destroy the very foundations of the Republic. A report was spread that the prince was to land at La Cirque and make his entry into Alca on a green horse. These rumors excited the fanatical monks, delighted the poor nobles, satisfied the rich Jewish ladies, and put hope in the hearts of the small traders. But very few of them were inclined to purchase these benefits at the price of a social catastrophe and the overthrow of the public credit, and there were fewer still who would have risked their money, their peace, their liberty, or a single hour from their pleasures in the business. On the other hand, the workmen held themselves ready as ever to give a day's work to the Republic, and a strong resistance was being formed in the suburbs. The people are with us, the pious Agaric used to say. However, men, women, and children, when leaving their factories, used to shout with one voice, Abba Chatillon, hou hou la calotte. As for the government, it showed the weakness, indecision, flabbiness, and heedlessness common to all governments, and from which none has ever departed without falling into arbitrariness and violence. In three words, it knew nothing, wanted nothing, and would do nothing. Formos, shut in his presidential palace, remained blind, dumb, deaf, huge, invisible, wrapped up in his pride as in an eiderdown. Count Olive advised the Dracophiles to make a last appeal for funds and to attempt a great stroke while Alka was still in a ferment. An executive committee, which he himself had chosen, decided to kidnap the members of the Chamber of Deputies and considered ways and means. The affair was fixed for the 28th of July. On that day the sun rose radiantly over the city. In front of the legislative palace women passed to market with their baskets, hawkers cried their peaches, pears, and grapes, cab horses with their noses in their bags munched their hay. Nobody expected anything, not because the secret had been kept, but because it met with nothing but unbelievers. Nobody believed in a revolution, and from this fact we may conclude that nobody desired one. About two o'clock, the deputies began to pass, few and unnoticed, through the side door of the palace. At three o'clock, a few groups of badly dressed men had formed. At half-past three, black masses coming from the adjacent streets spread over Revolution Square. This vast expanse was soon covered by an ocean of soft hats, and the crowd of demonstrators, continually increased by sightseers, having crossed the bridge, struck its dark wave against the walls of the legislative enclosure. Cries, murmurs, and songs went up to the impassive sky. Down with the deputies. Down with the Republicans. Death to the Republicans. The devoted band of Dracophiles, led by Prince de Boseno, struck up the august canticle. Behind the wall, silence alone replied. The silence and the absence of guards encouraged and at the same time frightened the crowd. Suddenly, a formidable voice cried out, Attack! And Prince de Boseno was seen raising his gigantic form to the top of the wall, which was covered with barbs and iron spikes. Behind him rushed his companions, and the people followed. Some hammered against the wall to make holes in it. Others endeavored to tear down the spikes and pull out the barbs. These defenses had given way in places, and some of the invaders had stripped the wall and were sitting astride on the top. Prince de Boseno was waving an immense green flag. Suddenly the crowd wavered, and from it came a long cry of terror. The police and the Republican carabiners, issuing out of all of the entrances of the palace, formed themselves into a column beneath the wall, and in a moment it was cleared of its besiegers. After a long moment of suspense the noise of arms was heard, and the police charged the crowd with fixed bayonets. An instant afterwards, and on the deserted square, strewn with hats and walking sticks, there reigned a sinister silence. Twice again the Dracophiles attempted to form. Twice they were repulsed. The rising was conquered, but Prince de Boseno, standing on the wall of the hostile palace, his flag in his hand, still repelled the attack of a whole brigade. He knocked down all who approached him. At last he, too, was thrown down, and fell on an iron spike, to which he remained hooked, still clasping the standard of the Draconides. 
On the following day the ministers of the Republic and the members of Parliament determined to take energetic measures. In vain this time did President Formos attempt to evade his responsibilities. The government discussed the question of depriving Chatillon of his rank and dignities and of indicting him before the High Court as a conspirator, an enemy of the public good, a traitor, etc. At this news the Emerald's old companions in arms, who the very evening before had beset him with their adulations, made no effort to conceal their joy. But Chatillon remained popular with the middle classes of Alca, and one still heard the hymn of the liberators sounding in the streets, It is Chatillon we want. The ministers were embarrassed. They intended to indict Chatillon before the high court, but they knew nothing. They remained in that total ignorance reserved for those who govern men. They were incapable of advancing any grave charges against Chatillon. They could supply the prosecution with nothing but the ridiculous lies of their spies. Chatillon's share in the plot, and his relations with Prince Crucho, remained the secret of the thirty thousand dracophiles. The ministers and the deputies had suspicions and even certainties, but they had no proofs. The public prosecutor said to the minister of justice, Very little is needed for a political prosecution, but I have nothing at all, and that is not enough. The affair made no progress. The enemies of the Republic were triumphant. On the 18th of September the news ran in Alca that Chatillon had taken flight. Everywhere there was surprise and astonishment. People doubted, for they could not understand. This is what had happened. One day, as the brave under-emerald Vulcan mold happened, as if by chance to go into the office of M. Babotan, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, he remarked with his usual frankness, M. Babotan, your colleagues do not seem to me to be up to much. It is evident that they have never commanded a ship. That fool Chatillon gives them a deuced bad fit of the shivers. The minister, in sign of denial, waved his paper knife in the air above his desk. I don't deny it, answered Vulcan Mould. You don't know how to get rid of Chatillon. You do not dare to indict him before the high court, because you are not sure of being able to bring forward a strong enough charge. Bigor will defend him, and Bigor is a clever advocate. You are right, Monsieur Barbertan. You are right. It would be a dangerous trial. Ah, my good friend said the minister in a careless tone, if you knew how satisfied we are. I receive the most reassuring news from my prefects. The good sense of the penguins will do justice to the intrigues of this mutinous soldier. Can you suppose for a moment that a great people, an intelligent, laborious people, devoted to liberal institutions, which Vulcanmold interrupted with a great sigh? Ah! If I had time to do it, I would relieve you of your difficulty. I would juggle away my Chatillon like a nutmeg out of a thimble. I would fillip him off to Porpoisia. The minister paid close attention. It would not take long, continued the sailor. I would rid you in a trice of the creature. But just now I have other fish to fry. I am in a bad hole. I must find a pretty big sum. But deuce take it. Honor before everything. The minister and under Emeril looked at each other for a moment in silence. Then Barbatan said with authority, Under Emeril Vulcanmold, get rid of this seditious soldier. You will render a great service to Penguinia, and the minister of home affairs will see that your gambling debts are paid. The same evening Vulcanmold called on Chatillon, and looked at him for some time with an expression of grief and mystery. Why do you look like that? asked the emeril in an uneasy tone. Vulcanmold said to him sadly, Old brother in arms, all is discovered. For the past half hour the government knows everything. At these words, Chatillon sank down overwhelmed. Vulcanmold continued, You may be arrested at any moment. I advise you to make off. And drawing out his watch, Not a minute to lose. Have I time to call on the Viscountess Olive? It would be mad said Vulcanmold, handing him a passport and a pair of blue spectacles, and telling him to have courage. I will, said Chatillon. Good-bye, old chum. Good-bye, and thanks. You have saved my life. That is the least I could do. A quarter of an hour later the brave Emeril had left the city of Alca. He embarked that night on an old cutter at La Cirque, and set sail for Porpoisia. 
but eight miles from the coast he was captured by a despatch boat, which was sailing without lights and which was under the flag of the Queen of the Black Islands. That queen had for a long time nourished a fatal passion for Chatillon. End of Book 5 Chapter 6